Good morning, Interweb. World Builders Log 2. In the last video, we built a main sequence star. In this video, we're going to wrap a planetary system around the star. But before we do that, let's talk some follow up. So, if you recall, I was humming and hawing about the color of the star, and I got a really interesting comment from Ellis E who has an astrophysics degree and professional experience, so they know way more than I do. Ella says, if you want to know what a 3500K star looks like, look at a 3500K incandescent filament light bulb. Not only is it the exact color, but it's the same brightness too. So a star of X Kelvin will look exactly like a bulb of X Kelvin. Class. Next up, I mentioned I was going to do up a little reference doc for this project. I have started work on that. It looks like this. Um, just as a placeholder name, I'm going to call the setting Artifexia. That will change once we do conlanging. We'll have a native term for the world. I got some table of contents. Beautiful. You got a chapter marker. This is very big, actually. Hold on. Let me bring this down. Uh, and then we have page one, which is the sun. So this is what we did last episode compiled into a, a neat format all the red text here is stuff that's either yet to be determined or will need a native term down the road so if you're interested in checking out this doc head on over to patreon links are in the description and there'll be a card at the end of the video final point of follow-up is on the spreadsheet itself lots of great positive comments which made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside so thank you all so much i'm glad you're getting something out of the spreadsheet Again, links in the description for anyone who wants to download it. Now, a couple of folks weren't able to download the spreadsheet. They followed the link, but they were met with an error message. As far as I can tell, people are getting that error message because their Google Drive storage is full. So the spreadsheet is attempting to download itself into your drive, but if there's no space, it'll throw an error message. So try freeing up a bit of space and then hopefully be able to get your hands on the sheet. Certainly that fixed some of the issues one of the patrons were having. So it might work for you. Keep me posted and I'll fix things as best I can. Also, a couple of you spotted some errors. Thank you very much in the spreadsheet. So I've updated them and this is a new version 1.01. .01. So again, you may want to go and make a new copy for yourself. All right, I think that is all of the follow-up. Let's get on to building a planetary system. So as always, before we build, let's do a little bit of explanation. Given that one of the goals of this series is to do everything really simplistically, we are going to aim to build a classical planetary system. And that basically is a planetary system like the one we are currently embedded in. So you got yourself a star and a planetary system that is divided into two broad areas, an inner system, and an outer system. More on that later. In a classical planetary system, the inner system is full of little rocky planets, and the outer system has your gas giants. And on top of that, the orbits of these various planets tend to be logarithmically spaced. So for example, this guy here is twice as far out as this guy. And then this guy is twice as far out as this guy again, etc, etc. It need not be exactly twice, but that's the general kind of trend. So that is what a classical planetary system looks like. This is not the only type of planetary system. You got like hot Jupiter systems where a gas giant forms in the outer reaches of a planetary system and then migrates inwards into a really tight in orbit, hence the name hot Jupiter. You got systems where you have a whole bunch of rocky worlds packed like impossibly close to one another. You got systems with like giant gaps in the middle. You got systems with multiple asteroid belts. Systems where all the bodies are on really weird eccentric orbits. There's a whole bunch of variety out there. But again, trying to keep things simple, we'll stick with a solar system like planetary system. So all of these stats here, these should be familiar to viewers of the last episode. We already worked those out last time. We just need to input them here again. Here's our first new parameter, the frost line. So the frost line is this demarcation point here between the inner and outer system. It's the point at which volatile compounds like water or methane, ammonia, carbon dioxide, that sort of thing, can exist as ices, where it's cold enough for those substances to be ices. And the importance here is that gas giants go beyond the frost line, rocky plants go starward of the frost line. 
Now, there's a couple of complications here. One, there is no such thing as a frost line. Like every single volatile compound will have a different frost line. Like the point at which it's cold enough for water to become ice is not the same point where it's cold enough for carbon dioxide to become ice, for example. So really there's like many frost lines, but here's where we're world building and not sciencing. So we'll just simplify things and we'll say there's one kind of general frost line and it occurs here. Further, I've never found a formula for the frost line in the literature. The formula I'm using here comes from GURP Space, which is a tabletop role-playing manual. It's worth picking yourself up a copy. It's great. And in general, like draws upon established science really well. So I have no real reason to doubt this, but just heads up. This isn't coming from like literature. This is coming from a tabletop RPG manual. Next up, we have this section, the stable orbit generator. And the way this works is that the spreadsheet uses a thing called Bode's law to generate a whole bunch of orbits for your system. And the way that Bode's Law works is that it asks you to input the orbit of your first planet in AU, and it asks you to set a sort of um, spacing factor. So the smaller this number, the more tightly packed the orbits will be, the larger this number, the more widely spaced they'd be. Now it's worth noting that Bode's Law, despite being called a law, isn't actually all that great at predicting where planets will be. Uh, like in our system, it works really well for the inner planets, but it starts to fall apart something serious for the outer planets. So much so that uh, people have tried to reformulate the law, but if you look at the craziness here, I can't even begin to scrutinize this. So to keep things simple, the conceit of the spreadsheet is that in this universe, Bode's law just holds. Because there's no reason why it wouldn't, or rather there's no reason that it couldn't for a given planetary system. So keep things nice and simple, just Bode's law holds for all orbits. Now, a couple of points here. For the first orbit, make sure it's beyond this point. This is the point of no return in terms of planets. If planets orbit inside this point, they'll be torn apart by your star. In fact, I would suggest having your first orbit be orders of magnitude removed from this inner limit, just to make sure you're absolutely safe. Any green orbits are orbits that fall in the habitable zone, so you can place habitable planets there. Any grey orbits are orbits that fall beyond the frost line, so that's where your gas giants will go. Specifically, the first orbit beyond the frost line will likely be home to your system's largest gas giant, your Jupiter analogue. And the first orbit immediately before the frost line will likely be home to an asteroid belt. The idea being that the gravity of the very, very large gas giant would disrupt any planet that might potentially want to form in an adjacent orbit, tear it apart and make an asteroid belt out of it. Now you'll note that there's an inner limit here, but I have no outer limit listed. That's because if you're going to do it correctly, determining the outer limit of a planetary system is really, really difficult. It involves computing what's known as the Hill Sphere of your star, which is like a bubble of space around the star, whereby if any object were inside said bubble, it would be gravitationally bound to the star. A, that's really difficult to compute, and B, as far as I can tell, such a bubble would be so large as to be kind of meaningless. So I've not included any outer limit and I've, I'm going to leave it up to your discretion to populate your orbits with an amount of planets that you think is appropriate. I would say maybe 10, 11, 12 maximum. Anything else on that? Oh yeah, yeah. These are just orbits, note. So once you've generated a big list of them, you can decide at will to populate them with planets or not. So you could say like, oh, there's a planet here, but no planet here. There's a planet there, planet there. Uh, asteroid belt here, gas giant here, no planet, no planet, gas giant. And you can justify this by invoking collisions, for example, like maybe there was a planet here, but something collided with it, broke it apart, all the debris got scattered, or maybe in the protoplanetary stage, there just wasn't enough stuff knocking around that area to form a substantial body, all that sort of jazz. So basically you have free reign to pick and choose from your list of stable orbits where you want your bodies to go. Once you've done that, you can locate your outermost gas giant, so your last orbit here, and if you input it here, the spreadsheet will generate a debris disk outward of that orbit, basically your system's Kuiper belt. And the way this works is that once the spreadsheet knows where that last gas giant is, it can find an orbit beyond that gas giant 
whereby if an object were to orbit here, it would orbit exactly two times for every three orbits of your gas giant. We would say that the object here is in two is to three mean motion resonance with the gas giant. The spreadsheet will also find another orbit beyond that again, whereby if an object were to orbit here, it would orbit one time for every two orbits of your outermost gas giant, i.e. it would be in one is to two mean motion resonance with your gas giant. Now these two resonance orbits or resonance lines or points or whatever are really stable and they'll act as a sort of corral, like your gas giant will corral a bunch of debris in between these two lines, forming, you guessed it, your system's Kuiper belt. Now the spreadsheet doesn't get into it because it's not really that important, but we'd expect there to be some sort of like significant dwarf planet in and around the 2 is 3 mean motion resonance point and another one around the 1 is 2 mean motion resonance line, plus like a whole bunch extra. But like, chances are there's not going to be a whole bunch of narrative action going on in your system's Kuiper belt, so I think it's just fine to say there exists a debris disk, it lies between here and here, and it's home to a bunch of small dwarf planets, notably this chap. Something like that. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, that is the spreadsheet explained. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pop in my star's mass that we created last time. Everything will populate and we'll see that the frost line moves out from where it was. Larger star or more massive star, frost line moves out. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fiddle with the first orbit and with the spacing factor until I get a spread of orbits I like. So time lapse, I will see you momentarily. Okay, something like that could work. So I think what I might do is I might say that I might leave this orbit blank. Um, this orbit here, I might say that's home to like a Mercury type analog. Um, I'll skip that orbit. Here's a habitable world. Uh, again, probably skip that orbit. Major gas giant goes on this orbit, we'll say. And I also said I wanted two to four planets, so I've got three now, so one more will be nice. Uh, so let's put a minor gas giant here. And just to bring in a little bit of interest. Yeah, let's say that we have an asteroid belt here and another one here. And the justification here is that we're sandwiched in between two gas giants. Lots of gravity going on there, so maybe it tore apart some minor objects to form these things. Now, I think Jupiter is at about 5 AU, I think, and I think the asteroid belt is about 2.8 AU in our system. So it's worth noting that the distance from my major gas giant to my asteroid belt here is way more than that. So I think what I'll do to compensate, just to be safe, I'll make this gas giant like major, like a lot more massive than um, than Jupiter. And again, the hopefully that will kind of, in my head, it justifies there being a second asteroid, asteroid belt as well. We just have an exceedingly large gas giant here that just wrecked stuff all around it. So yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, so 47.57 AU for my last gas giant, this fella here. So let me drop that in. 47.57 AU gives me a debris disk from 62 to 75 AU. And we'd expect there to be some sort of dwarf planet here. So I'll make a note of that and stick it in the reference doc. All right, that's that done. Now, this is kind of getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but I'd like to check this. Whilst our habitable world is indeed inside the habitable zone, which goes from 1.4 AU to 2 AU, so 1.69 is definitely in the habitable zone, that just means that it's warm enough for liquid water to be on the surface of this planet. This planet may still be exceedingly hot or exceedingly cold by Earth standards. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to have it be within a degree or two of modern day Earth such that I can draw on the various coping climate zones of modern day Earth, etc. 
Because, you know, if, if climate change has taught us anything, very subtle changes to temperature can completely wreak havoc on a planet. So I want to make sure this can be made to be, this planet can be made to be about 15 degrees Celsius, which is the average temperature of Earth. So to do that, again, I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself here. I'm going to go to the planet tab and I'm going to input my star's mass again so everything populates and drop down here to uh, physical characteristics these cells here in fact these cells plus this cell play a role in determining the temperature of the planet um so what was my where did it orbit 1.69 au so it orbits at 1.69 au all right so it's negative three degrees celsius on average again that is warm enough for there to be liquid water somewhere on the planet but like it's gonna be a cold 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 place let's see if we can twiddle with stuff to get this in and around 15 degrees so the albedo here albedo is a measure of how reflective or absorptive a planet is the scale here goes from zero to one zero is a perfect absorber one is a perfect reflector so the earth is 0 0.29 here so it absorbs most of the energy that hits it uh, but some of it is reflected back and the greenhouse effect here is how much does the atmosphere contribute towards heating of the planet. If you put in zero there, you have no atmosphere, so there's no greenhouse effect. One is a greenhouse effect equivalent to modern day Earth. And I think it's 200, is it? Yeah, 200 would be the equivalent of the greenhouse effect on Venus. So go, don't go anywhere near 200, basically. Uh, so I'm going to, by and large, I'm going to mess with these two uh, to change the temperature. And I may move this uh, habitable world around a little bit to do so as well. I I'd like to keep the albedo Earth-like as well, because the albedo is determined by the amount of water on the planet and like the spread of biomes. So like, so like how much of the surface area is taken up with ice caps, for example, will play a role in albedo. Again, I'd like to draw on modern day climate zones. So I I'd like to keep this in and around here. So really, I think it's these two parameters that are main they're the main source of changing this temperature. So again, time lapse, give me a few minutes and I'll try and get this fella somewhere more conducive. So uh, that was easy. All I had to do was nearly double the greenhouse effect and we're basically in a modern Earth range. Again, I'm willing to go plus or minus one degree. Modern Earth is 15 degrees, 14 degrees suits me perfectly. Now that is not to say that the greenhouse effect is necessarily twice as strong as it is a modern day earth. I don't actually understand this scale very well. It comes from, it comes from this planet temperature calculator from uh, the University of Indiana. And I had a look through the source code of this page and pulled the maths from this section. Again, not entirely sure what the scale is here, but it seems to get decent results. Anyways, in summation, Earth-like albedo, greenhouse effect is stronger, semi-major axis is at 1.69 AU. I am happy with that, and we'll explore more of this page at a later date. All right, well, that's that. One planetary system done. I am going to head off now and start work on the reference doc. Again, Patreon, links in the description if you want to get your hands on it. I hope you all enjoyed, and until next time, Edgar out.